So uh, I'm Bernie Enger, I work for General Electric. For those of you that are not aware of who we are, we're a $150 billion industrial financial powerhouse. It actually is uh, at the heart of, of it all a, a technology company. So when you think about General Electric, where you think about us as the you know, supplier of uh, turbines for the planes that you flew in here, or whether you think about as the creator of uh, products to create or distribute energy or control automations, I'd say we define ourselves above all as a company where, where technology and technologists have, uh, have actually center stage. Things actually reflected in our, in our strategy, in our strategy as well. Now within, uh, within GE, actually I work for a, for a group called GE Intelligent Platforms. I, whenever I get into a forum with customers, I, I, the, the reaction I typically get is, I don't know who GE Intelligent Platforms is, is I used to deal with GE Fanex. And the reality is, for those of you that are not aware of that, uh, about a year and a half ago, G and FANUC parted ways. We actually purchased you know, full ownership of our control platforms, our software, our software platforms, our embedded technology, partially on a, on, a, on a belief very similar to what Raj was talking about on Siemens, which is this notion that uh, we really see software and controls as the engine behind a, a very significant need for enhanced productivity, allowing us to compete. And for us, just like, just like uh, for Siemens, this is both an internal need and as an, ex an external need. We do have 150 major plants around the world, uh, and we actually look at our, our industrial software technology as a way of driving productivity in there. We look at our control technology as a way of doing that beyond the technology we may put in our products, the technology we sell to our, to our customers. I actually happen to run the controls group for, for uh, intelligent platforms. And uh, really, I, I'm gonna take you to a very different place during the next, uh, during the next uh, few slides. Starting from, a, uh, from a, a, a picture we've actually been sharing with our customers in the last, uh, over the last uh, six to nine months. And basically what we've been telling customers is that uh, we're actually dramatically simplifying how we're thinking about the industrial automation backbone at GE. And we essentially see a future where all the, uh, all the connections between the elements of the automation infrastructure are ethernet based. Where we're essentially, in our particular case, we are picking Propinet as the fundamental backbone at the IO network layer, uh, but we're also standardizing on Ethernet for everything above there. And we're really where we see a, a strong emergence of what, what I'm gonna call uh, cloud technologies as a way in which people interact with, uh, people interact with machines. So what I wanted to do in the next few slides is not tell you about the details of the G implementation of this thing, but tell you about some of the thinking that went into why we're going this way and why you know, we just become so passionate about about Profinet as a technology to, do, uh, to, to, to be part of this, uh, to be part of this equation, right? And I'm just, the, uh, just gonna go look at a little bit at uh, industry trends, right? And we're gonna look at these things from, a, from both a challenge and opportunity perspective. You know, starting with, uh, starting with uh, the uh, age of the automation infrastructure, the reality is the, the automation infrastructure, primarily in this country and in Europe, is just uh, absurdly old. I think uh, ARC says there's over $20 billion whereas the control systems that are over 20 years old in this country. Uh, like Raj said, uh, said earlier, it's impossible to compete against emerging economies with uh, infrastructure that is completely, that's completely outdated. And I tell you, this is, this is beyond just performance. This is about compliance risk, uh, whether you are worried about security or, or everything else. That, that's actually, I think that's, that's something that, uh, that for the customers that haven't, uh, haven't moved forward should be a wake up, should be a wake up call. Of course, the, uh, the, the the silver lining behind this is there's a uh, relatively easy cost-effective way of becoming more competitive, you know, relative to the infrastructure cost of, uh, you know, pouring cement and, and putting metal on the ground, you know, updating controls, applying software to make a plant more productive is a lot more, is a lot more manageable. And I'm very comfortable saying there's a lot of technology that can make a huge difference relative to what we had, what we had a, a while ago. And, and really the, the way, the way we, uh, we actually think about this thing is saying, hey, how do you enable that modernization sort of minimizing both the cost of modernizing and maximizing the uh, return of what the new systems put together. And I, I bring that up, it's because if you just uh, do it by doing the same thing you did only with chips that run faster, you're not gonna get any real benefit, right? There has to be some thinking behind that that, that creates more productivity. The second, the second big trend that really affects, you know, how, how, we think about, how we think about our platforms has to do with, has to do with, with uh, demographics. You know, we all tend to hear this side of the story, the one that says, hey, 40% of the skilled manufacturing force is within about five years of retirement in this country. Actually, there's a, there's a, second, there's a second stat which is uh, equally valuable, the one that says 
in the BRIC countries, but 41% of customers believe that lack of qualified resources are the fundamental reason why growth is not faster. So I mean, you really have, there is a significant challenge in terms of access to people, actually access to qualified people to get work done. You know, even when you think about, when you think about the, uh, the, the recovery in the US, that, you know, th there's a lot of talk about joblessness, which is actually a, a valid point, but the reality is this is really a two-stage recovery. Hiring or finding qualified people is incredibly hard. I'd say that the employment rate for highly qualified people is, is very, very high. In the, and we see, that, we see that trend continuing. The, uh, the second element around the demographic shift, which we think is, is very, very relevant, actually very, very important, has to do with, okay, so old people are retiring, what next? And the reality is there's a, there's a generation of people entering, in the, uh, entering the workforce that was uh, born digital. And I'm gonna use a, a story to illustrate to what, how dramatic born digital can be primarily when, in comparison to those of us in this room. And I don't want to make all of you feel as old as I am, but I think it's, it's interesting. There's a recent article saying that the, uh, the, 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 there's a major trend, trend between tweeners. So tweeners would be kids between 11 and 13 years old. And the relationships, so their first relationships, boy-girl relationships, were the predominant trend for those relationships that they actually start over text messaging, develop, and happen over text mes messaging and break down over text messaging without any in-person communication. Now that to me is a completely foreign concept. Right? <laughs> I just say it sounds boring, but whatever. The, that's <laughs> Beyond that, I think the, 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 the underlying point behind this is that when we think about the generation of people that are entering the workforce, the generation of people that are going to determine how automation is implemented in the next you know, 10 to 20 years, and I, I probably picked the, the extreme case and people that are a few years away, is they actually are gonna think about technology different than the way we thought about that, right? You know, the third, uh, the third element is around technology acceleration cycles, and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the key, and this is actually a, probably a key reason why the, all the bits in our, in our Go Forward platform are so uh, separate and, and really connected over, over an Ethernet wire with each other. Uh, the, the simplest illustration I have on this one is that the average life cycle of an Intel major chip family is less than half of the life cycle expected of a control system put in a plant. Sort of a, today, Intel will tell you that a, that a chip from a first introduction to retirement has seven years. If you assume that the first two are early adoption, that gives you five years of useful life. Uh, I would love for all of our customers to replace all the control systems every five years. That would, be a, that would be a very, I'm sure that you wouldn't mind that either, right? Just that would be okay with you too. So, so, so think about that. So essentially what this, what this says is that the underlying technology, if, you know, if, if you're trying to create stability in a, in, a, in a control infrastructure, you need to make sure that you can replace all the hardware bits without actually affecting how the system runs and without affecting the, uh, the assets that are running on those, uh, on those systems. You know, the opportunity behind the technology acceleration, right, is that uh, you really get access to a ton of computing power to solve, to solve problems. You know, and the, and uh, when you have a little bit of computing power, then the only way to, uh, to get optimal results, if you're looking for that last ounce of performance, is to create you know, very compact, very sometimes even convoluted solutions to problems. When you have tons of computing, uh, computing power, you can think about that different. And I'll, I'll use a couple of, I'll, I'll show a couple of examples outside of our industry around that later. So there, there's, a huge, uh, there's a huge opening in there. And really we need to make sure that, that we implement things so that there is, there is minimal disruption between generations. And then the, the fourth trend that, that I would look at is this, this notion of the, uh, the, internet, the internet of machines. The, uh, some interesting statistics in here. Ericsson, who's you know, the, the guys that make uh, telecommunication equipment, they actually estimate that by 2020, there'll be about 75 billion machines or pieces of equipment connected to the, to the internet. And there's actually some, uh, some interesting examples. So you know, we, we tend to think about, hey, should my control system at a offshore, power plant, uh, offshore uh, exploration plant be connected to something else? And these guys are actually talking about cows being connected to the internet. So if they're going to get sick, you would know, you would know in advance, right? I, the, the reason I, I bring this thing up and the reason I'm, I'm just sort of trying to, to push the dial is because if we're not thinking about how our stuff connects with the rest of the world, if we don't think about how our equipment becomes part of a very vastly connected world, 
we're probably going to be not, not competitive. Right? Of course, the, uh, the opportunity in, uh, in connecting is actually a, a tremendous, tremendous boost to productivity, through, uh, not just through access to information, but through analysis of what the information really, really means. You know, when, uh, if you think about Google and the value they derive from data today, right? uh, they actually started collecting that data 20 years before knowing that they were actually using it. Right? Just the, uh, and I think the same, the same applies to a certain way, in a certain way to our world. So, so with, those, with those sort of trends in mind, we're thinking about a demographic shift, thinking about a technology cycle acceleration, thinking about an, an internet of machines. You know, the, what we think are the right questions to ask when you think about middle-long term is, hey, number one, I say, what kind of infrastructure are you going to go put in place in your control systems to make sure that that generation of people that was born digital can actually get the maximum value of what they're capable of doing, right? Uh, number two is, if you really want to be part of, a, of an ecosystem of 75 billion machines, what kind of infrastructure are you going to go put in place that makes sure that the connection between those machines can be done in an automatic way? Because I can guarantee you, you're not going to go hand tune the connection of 75 billion things together. Right? That's going to happen in a different mechanism. And then uh, finally, as you go do that, uh, of course, you know, you've got to be aware of what are the industry specific concerns. You know, the, uh, as, you know, we all know the type of equipment that we control. We all know the implications of a failure. And you know, the, uh, not to be mean to the cow, but if the cow gets sick, it's probably okay if our controls don't uh, run, we end up with major you know, ecological or people disasters, which none of us want. Right? So then the, the next stage, uh, let's, let me take you to uh, some of the technologies, sort of interesting technologies at work. And these are mainstream technologies today outside of the automation world, but th that I think actually have a point of connect to how we actually think about the world of automation going forward. And I'm going to start this thing. I don't know if you actually have read this article. There's a very interesting article that was published by Mark Andresin. Mark Andresin is the guy that invented Netscape and who's now a sort of a, a partner at a major venture, uh, venture capitalist firm. And he wrote an article called uh, Why Software is, uh, is Eating the World. And, and basically, the, the, the fundamental premise of the article is that when you marry uh, IT technology to a traditional business model, you can just create a tremendous a tremendous disruption. As a consequence of that, there's, an enti there's entire industries that are actually just uh, reshaping. And the reason why what I want to start in here is because in most of those industries, there was a way of doing things that was based on a different paradigm, and there was an incumbent that thought that will never happen to us. And to me, the best, easiest example is to think about borders signing out the digital uh, book content to Amazon. Right? That was 10 years ago. Today, you know, Borders is no longer. And Amazon, as you all know, is actually a pretty significant retailer out there. But this has happened in a number of, uh, of uh, different industries. Uh, think about media, whether it's music or whether it's actually movies or so on. Think about how that actually has gone from, from, from one mechanism to the other one, essentially enabled by the integration of the activity and, uh, and, IT, and IT technology. So this is, a, again, just, just as, a, as, a, as a thought trigger, think about when, when if, uh, if the next few slides feel uncomfortable, if the last few slides feel uncomfortable, I am sure they felt uncomfortable to the guys at Sony. I'm sure they felt uncomfortable to the guys at uh, Borders. I'm sure they felt uncomfortable to whoever was competing against uh, Amazon in, in retail. Right? So we, we, just, we better get comfortable being uncomfortable. So here's, a, here's, here's some of the elements that we look at in terms of things that we think are not uh, easy, that are not possible to do, where other people actually have done that, and, the, uh, and, and I, think, I think they're relevant. The first one is around this notion of sort of cloud-based secure communications. And the example I'm going to use is Skype. Uh, for those of you that don't know Skype, it's essentially a, 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 an, a sort of computer-based voice over IP video and, and, and calling system. It's actually the fastest growing telecommunications company in the world. Uh, just the, by way of example, the, uh, they've actually, they have more volume now than the number three communications company in the country, which is Century, which is Century Link. The, uh, the other thing that's actually fascinating about, uh, about Skype is they have no infrastructure. So not only are they number three supplier, I mean, look at some of those numbers, right? Uh, you know, at, any, at the peak time, you have 23 million people connected onto a Skype. Eight million of those people actually pay, even though you can use the product for free. There, there, there's, there's options that you actually pay for, for video, for group video calling and a couple of other things. Uh, people are actually uh, paying about $100 a year 
to, uh, to Skype. A third of those calls are, are video calls, and actually a third of the users are actually business users. And where, the reason I'm actually drawing, uh, drawing this connection is because these guys actually have figured out a few things. You know, they've actually figured out, number one, is how to create the secure communications over public networks. Right? So uh, when you, when you uh, and actually you can, you can do some research, you can even starting it with Wikipedia on how actually that works, but you can actually get sort of secure connectivity, you know, uh, broad based, and that can be, you know, speaking with someone between here and China. I don't know about China, but uh, between here and most parts, <laughs> most parts in the world, uh, securely. The other thing too that's interesting about how Skype works is actually it's incredibly scalable. Uh, you know, the, uh, so if you wanted the, the techie version, the way that, the, you know, Skype, Skype has a directory of users, which actually allows you to create a sort of a trust relationship. So I'm going to choose who the people that I allow to speak with me are. And, uh, and basically, the directory is actually used to, to determine those trusts and to start a connection. But once the connection exists, it's actually point to point, and there's no central infrastructure involved. That's why adding another 10 million users to Skype costs zero. Now think about that, right? Just think, think about how different that is than, than the way an AT&T would be, an AT&T would be thinking. So point number one, there is technology out there today that allows point to point secure communications to actually happen over a public cloud-based network. And actually, I, I, I contrast that with the way we tend to think about our world where we say nobody will come close to my world. The reality is at some point in time, someone will come to our world and it's just better if it's us than if it's somebody else, you know? Primarily for the companies that, 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 that we all represent. The second, uh, the second element, and this one, I, I know this one feels way out there from the automation world, but uh, this concept of uh, computing on demand, you know, uh, think about how we, uh, how we buy and use PLCs today. You know, we, we buy a PLC for a machine or for a process, right? The reality is that if you're actually setting up a, if you're setting up a, uh, a web-based system in uh, sort of in, in commercial land and use someone like, uh, someone like Amazon, you actually buy computing power on demand. You don't buy a computer. You buy access for n number of users to x terabytes of data with y access time. And if you need more, you just pay for more, and you need less, you actually pay, pay for less, right? And I, I bring this thing up because, again, it's, it feels far-fetched, and I know it's far-fetched relative to the problems we solve today. I mean, it, trust me, when we put a control system for a turbine today, we're not using you know, scalable controllers, okay? But frankly, I know we will. I just, I just know, you know, my sense is that it's just a matter of time as to when, when that actually happens. And it actually creates a tremendous amount of, amount of flexibility. Uh, discrete manufacturing places where you have significant line changers and so on, I think there's an opportunity to think about, think about differently. This is the other interesting point too, is the, uh, the cost of setting this up. So there was a comparison about how, what it actually costs you to set up an online store with this kind of capabilities uh, 10 years ago versus now. It's actually 100 times cheaper than it was, uh, than it was 10 years ago. Right? Now forward, you know, five years further, and that actually would say it's gonna be at least 10,000 times cheaper. It, and again, that's why w when you start looking at that type of economics, just assuming that our industry can go unchanged for the next 10 years, I, th I think it's just a little bit naive. The third, the third, uh, the third element, so, so element number one, hey, this secure uh, communications running on, on the public cloud today. Number two, there is access to, to computing power on demand on the, on the world today. Number three is there is a tremendous trend towards what I'm gonna call collaborative content creation. And it's another foreign concept in our, in our industry. Wikipedia, great example. You know, Wikipedia creates more content in a month than any single person could read in a month. So you think, but I think they, they say that the average, or the average person could, could probably read 27,000 pages in a month if that's all they did. Uh, you know, Wikipedia creates 30,000 pages per minute. There's over, over a billion people have looked at this. This is actually probably the most referenced encyclopedia in the world today. What I find fascinating about this thing is not so much that, it's the fact that Wikipedia runs with 80 people and $17 million budget. Again, dramatically different set of economics, right? Dramatically different set of economics. You know, the Facebook, uh, I think everybody knows Facebook, but they, they, there's, a, there's an interesting element around Facebook, which is uh, when we actually had a conversation around dinner on, on this. Not only is Facebook a mainstream platform for, if you look at that age group, you know, they have about 900 million users, 150 million users, 
two-thirds are people that are in the workforce today, are in the age, sort of the uh, sort of 20 to 55 category. So, so this is technology that people use today to uh, share all kinds of primarily personal content. But the really interesting thing that, that I wanted to mention about uh, Facebook is these guys actually have, through a number of iterations, figured out how you manage privacy in a, in a, global, in a global context. Right? So if you think about Facebook went through, they've been in the newspapers a number of times over the last few years. But I think today, they've actually created a model that's fairly simple around what content is shared, what content is private, and what content is you know, somewhere in between those two things. Again, so that you can, the key point is that you can share content in public settings while protecting the integrity of that content. And there's tremendous progress happening in there. I, I bring that up because if you look at that speed of acceleration, again, fast forward for the next 10 years and think about how that applies to us, right? I, I think then this notion of, of combining public and private information from an infrastructure perspective is not as far-fetched as it, as it may feel. And this is sort of the final example in here around, around collaboration. This is actually very interesting. The, the biggest software company in the world today from a, is, a, is an organization called Top Coder. Top Coder has no developers. They have 390,000 plus members. I think uh, we did this thing. We actually looked at this statistic twice within 12 hours, and they had added another 200 people to their, to their team. So I just I thought it would be fun to, to put on the, on the slide. But this is what's actually interesting about the way, the way uh, Top Coder works. It's, uh, you, have, uh, you have people that need uh, software done and people that are willing to do it. And uh, if I need something done, I just con I'll post a problem there, and I will actually post how much I'm willing to pay for the resolution of that problem. Let's say, you know, I need someone to write me a piece of X and I'm willing to pay $5,000 to the solution I choose to buy. And actually, I may choose to say I'm going to pay $5,000 to, to the solution I choose to buy and $2,000 to the second best solution. Okay? And then people compete for that. Now, other people, you know, so they may, you may actually have 10 people competing for this work. Eight people essentially do it for free because they, their solution doesn't get chosen. And, you know, this is, this is primarily an American company. As you know, you know, we don't like doing a lot of stuff for nothing in this country, right, in general. Yet this model works, and they have 400,000 people engaged in there. And the point I'm trying to make in here is what really has happened in that world is people have figured out a way of creating reusable content. You know, when that developer is participating in a contest to solve a problem for somebody else, they're not doing 1,000 hours of work for free. They have figured out a solution to a series of problems that they can adapt and essentially sell a thousand hours of previously created work at no, at no cost. And I think that's important too because I think that trend eventually will impact how we buy and how we, uh, how we build and how we assemble solutions in the control, in the control world. So, so hopefully by now I've actually made you sufficiently, sufficiently uncomfortable, right? So if you summarize this stuff, the reality is looking outside of our world, the reality that there, there is today at work Technology that allows self-assembly, assembling networks to, to integrate into ecosystems, whether that be the, the Skype example is probably the best example of that. There are secure, efficient, you know, high-performance protocols out there for exchanging data on public networks. The scalable computing power available on demand. And there's really both a, a series of collaboration platforms and a, an emerging collaboration culture that, uh, that, that is very mainstream with very large numbers of, of, users, of users involved. So the question is, you know, how does this apply to automation? You know, why, why are you taking me down this trip, Bernie? And, and really our hypothesis right, is that usage of these technologies over a certain horizon of time will actually help, will, will, will have a significant impact on productivity of, uh, of, of, of industrial platforms. And, and we really think about these things in, in terms of, in three terms, you know. Number one is this notion of Ethernet everywhere and this notion of a standard protocols really as the, as the glue, to, the, 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 the only form of glue that stays. You know, what gets connected on the nodes and that Ethernet can change an infinite number of times, but that glue stays. Number two is this idea of, hey, scalable collaborative collaboration platforms is, is, a second, is a second element. And the third element is ecosystem, and the difference between those two is a, a collaboration platform is a, simply something that allows, is a medium that allows work done. Ecosystem is the way people get organized around how that work gets, uh, work gets done. So by way of example, you know, Siemens and GE can both use Salesforce.com. That will be the collaboration platform we're using 
I can guarantee you Siemens and G are not sharing the content of our relative Salesforce.com <laughs> implementations, right? So I, I hope so, so. First, I'd be going to jail. Number two, I don't think that'll be, that think would that would work out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, I think you understand you understand the uh, the point in it. So. Let me, let me uh, give you an example. This is actually a result of a study. We've actually some work we've actually been doing for the last uh, year and a half you know, the, uh, in, the, in the water industry. So, so what you see on the, on the screen here is a picture of uh, system integrators that have uh, recorded uh, expertise or, or experience in, uh, in the water segment. So this would be treatment and conveyance type applications. So we went out there and surveyed every single system integrator in the, in the country, or, or we actually uh, looked at a directory of all of them, looked at all of the ones that uh, claim to be uh, capable or have expertise in the, in, in the water segment, and we actually plop them on a map. And when you look at that map, you would say, there's a lot of system integrators that know, that know water. That's what that map would say, right? That's a map of water treatment facilities in the country. Now, the picture on the right-hand side, in the, in, this, is a, this is in the US. The, in the US, there's about 45,000 water, uh, water facilities. Of those 45,000, 43,000 have served less than 50,000 users. And actually what's fascinating is 73% of the counties in the US have no local system integrators that have a water expertise. So why is that, why is that a problem? And, the, and the, you can read the quotes at the bottom, but, the, but essentially the cost of serving these customers is high as perceived by the customers themselves, right? The access to the type of solutions that are gonna allow you to take care of everything from regulatory compliance to optimize energy use and so on are just not accessible to people because of a combination of costs. And frankly, even for people, for, for, for the major vendors, you know, those of us in, in this room and others, the economics of serving you know, that small customer in uh, Bear Mountain, uh, California, are just not there, right? Because you're not really gonna go and have one of your salespeople drive four hours up the mountain of the Bear Lake to sell a $500 PLC. It's just, you're just not gonna do that, right? So essentially you end up with a segment that in aggregate is enormous that becomes underserved and the need really is common for, 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 all, of those, for all of those customers, right? Now the interesting thing is that these guys, when you go speak with them, have actually, uh, have actually created some very strong informal networks for collaborating between them. So if you just go ask, how do you solve problems? And we actually, we, we had third parties do this thing for us. The reality is they, they, end, up, uh, they end up asking the trusted person or, or the trusted engineer within their, within their driving time distance. That's kind of the way it works. So if you look at, at, at most of the, those smaller facilities, they will look at, hey, who is within my two-hour driving distance that I actually trust? That's the guy I go ask to figure out what I should be, what I should be doing. And we believe that there's, there's a path to a different way. So let me, let me talk about uh, what, what this could look like. Right? So imagine now putting together some of, the, uh, some of the elements that we were talking about earlier or some of the technology we were talking about earlier to try to solve a problem like the water problem. So you would, you would start, with, you would start with, a, with a platform that would allow people in, the, in, in this particular in the industry to engage in a digital community that actually brings together both the expertise and content. And when I talk about content, I'm talking about you know, specific solutions that, for example, would help you you know, improve efficiency on your pumps, on your treatment process, you know. So I'm talking about, about real, real content to solve very specific problems. You know, as a second stage, you could say, hey, that, that platform could also have ready-made solutions for the industry. So if you were to think about my top coder example before, why can't you envision a similar example where the, uh, the quote-unquote top coders in our industry or solution provider system integrators actually productize the solutions they have and make them available through, a, through an industry. And then the uh, third element is once a customer chooses to procure and deploy a solution, that same platform becomes the, uh, the way in which they interact with that, with that solution. And in, not only in which they interact with the solution, but in, in the way in which, their, in which their customers and their suppliers interact with that solution as well. So basically you end up using and sort of an online collaboration ecosystem as an, as an environment for learning, as an environment for developing, and as an environment for operating and collaborating on a running, on a running system. The, this kind of stuff is probably a lot closer to reality than, than it may feel. Now, you, okay, so you're not in the water industry. You instead are an operator of a large fleet. How would that apply to you? The reality is the only thing that would change is how you define your ecosystem. Your ecosystem or your community, maybe the employees in your, in your company and your suppliers, you know? The, 
actually so the catalog of solutions may not be people trying to sell you stuff. It just may be a way of creating reusable content inside of the boundaries of, the, of your firm. And really the deployment would just simply be a view inside of the walls of your firm instead of being a, you know, sort of a, a view that's actually shared, shared differently. So, so really you can, uh, if, you, if you think, if you stretch your mind a little bit, you can start seeing a sort of world in which, in which things could be just done, done differently. So, so there's two things that can be, you can be thinking at this stage, you know. One is, boy, you know, this could be spot on. The other, the other one is, you know, Bernie's absolutely crazy. <laughs> here's, the, here's the interesting thing, you know, the, the, probably the more sophisticated business, business planning tool in, in Vogue today is this, uh, this uh, idea of scenario planning and options, right? So, so scenario, is, scenario planning is all about, hey, picture the future in two different ways or in three different ways, right? And now think about what are the choices you can make today that end up working regardless of what plays out. Right? So that, that, would be the, that would be the idea. So what I'm going to encourage you to do for a second is think about what I just, I just talked about as one scenario. And you can think about the other scenario as being, hey, things pretty much stay the way they are today. And then in that context, think about, hey, what are the two or three things that you could do as a customer that would work in both, that would work in both instances? And this is where I'm going to go bring, bring us full circle back to why Profinet and why, and why, did we, why is that actually relevant to us, you know? The, 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 first, the first suggestion we would have is if you're in industrial automation and you're not adopting Ethernet, you're screwed in all scenarios, <laughs> right? Could you be more explicit? I mean, that's just a, it's, it's, it's that simple, right? Think, think about how the world is connecting. I mean, the world's connecting with Ethernet. If you're, if you're playing any different card, I think you're, I think you're whatever, you're going to be in trouble. And the reality is once you do that, and this is where, where, where we, we come at Profinet from a very different place than, uh, than our competitor Siemens, we chose to adopt this technology on, on purely on technical merit. The, we, when we actually looked at, uh, at the world of open networks, you know, we have actually had Ethernet-based networks in our solution set for a long, long time. The, uh, and we actually wanted to make a transition to an open, to an open network. We evaluated everything that was out there. And we, you know, Profinet just simply works better. I did, I did, I, there's a little uh, oscilloscope capture there on the left, and just by way of example, the uh, when when we run a when we run sort of a single wire redundant network, it takes us three microseconds to determine that there's a network breakage connection. Three microseconds, which means we can we can guarantee at sort of the one millisecond spec, we can guarantee bumpless, you know, transfer all the time. So absolutely, with absolutely such a big you know, margin of, of so this big safety margin that will we'll tell our customers, well, you can do this thing. The technology enables that kind of stuff, you know, the, the spec enables that, that kind of stuff. It's fast, it's incredibly robust, whether you think about the redundancy capabilities, whether you think about the diagnostic capabilities, where you think about the, uh, how easy it is to do, uh, to replace a broken node with a, with a new node. It's actually, it's, it's, it's incredibly good. And then finally, it has a, one of the things that makes us comfortable is it has a very, very rich ecosystem. You know, starting with, starting with the board, if you think about who's there, there's, you know, there's Siemens and ourselves, there's Ender, there's Phoenix, there's really, I think, 150 vendors today that have a Profinet-based solutions, over 600 devices certified or a number like that. And we see that, we see that world growing. So, so bet number one, just sort of bet on Ethernet, will be an advocate, continue to be an advocate for, uh, for Profinet just because the technology works. It just, it just works, it just works better than anything that, that's out there. Suggestion number two, and, and suggestion number one actually works uh, even if I am crazy, you know. Suggestion number two <laughs> also works even if, even if I am crazy. I, what, I, what I'm going to say in here is just the, uh, and there was, a, there was a comment made in the panel yesterday, which I think was, was pretty good. I think you, you talked, said, uh, hey, the, uh, the, one of the reasons why Ethernet matters to you is because the MES, you know, the, the MES applications are sort of reaching out to get more data than, than before. The, 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 our, our second suggestion is, you know, create, you know, assume there's going to be applications that you don't control in, 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 in your world that are going to from, uh, from your world. It's just, it's just going to happen. And if you start thinking about that, you know, what our encouragement is think a little bit differently about how you expose the data in your applications. The reality is most sophisticated customers for a long time have had some kind of standards for how they, how they exchange data. So, you know, I remember 20, 30 years ago working into, in Ford, you know, we want to 
if they were using a Modicon PLC, they had you know, a, a range of registers that were actually used to exchange data from that transfer station to the next and the next. So it's not people have not done that. Frankly, all of those mechanisms have one, one significant point of fragility, which is they require the expertise of the guy that put the solution in place to know how things are going to work. And if the user was sophisticated, that information is actually captured in a document. But if you start thinking, go back to my idea of 75 billion things connected to each other, the things that need to connect into you are things that you need them to connect without you being involved, and just has to happen. And the, the, the simple way to do that is to just start thinking about exposing yourself to using some, some standard, some form of standard protocol. So a couple of examples, I will, we'll, uh, you know, I'll go back to things like Profi Energy. In, in Profinet world, just take advantage of profiles. So think about how, how profiles work in the, in, the, in, the, in the scope of work that you actually do. So Profi Energy, if you're trying to, to be part of a scheme, the reality is there will be an application out there that's going to try to manage and manage energy in your plant. Get yourself ready by by using tools like that. I, I, we we actually see that uh, that that profiles world getting richer as a consequence of that. Or you know I think our friends at the OPC Foundation do a nice job as well at, at, at defining a way in which in which applications can interoperate with your controllers the right way and only the right way. And then the second element in here is around security. Uh, Control systems historically are insecure by design. And what I mean by this thing is, you don't really have to hack a controller. You just need to access it through its programming port, right? I mean, it's, that's, it's as simple as that, right? And yes, most of, uh, most of the controls out there have a way of you, you know, having a password to block <coughs> either programming access or not and data access or not. But when you say data access or not, that's a pretty big swath, right? That's a pretty big swath. So that's why I think this actually matters because if you assume that if you assume that applications are going to connect with your systems, you need to make sure that you start protecting yourself from people that are going to that, that could just go into the wrong place in your application. And assumption uh, assumption number three or suggestion number three is uh, really assume that your content can be can be reused. Now the easiest sort of simplest thing to think about this thing is uh, and the recommendation we give customers is record everything, store everything. I used a Google example a few minutes ago. Uh, Google was storing data about searches without knowing how they were going to go create value from that. And as you all know, if you look at the stock ticker, they've created a fair bit of value from that. I would contend that the same thing is true about a lot of the data that flows, that flows through your plants. So there's a lot of computing power out there. Take advantage of it. Historize anything, even, even if you have no idea what you're going to be using it for. You, you will, or somebody will on your, on your behalf in the future. So. so but you know, in, in, in summary, you know, lots of, lots of uh, evolving technology out there that I think over the next 10 years are gonna make our industry kind of fun. Everything from new people coming in to entirely new technologies, you know, dropping dramatically in terms of accessibility costs and increasing dramatically in capability and, and, and security. And then at the end of that, whether you choose to believe it or not, sort of three, fairly, there's two or three very simple things you can actually do to protect yourself in the case I happen to be right, you know? Yeah. With that, thank you. Indeed.